Welcome to the Never Been Promoted podcast, where we're all about helping you cut the tie to all that holds you back. The excuses, the fears, the people, that sense of entitlement. Cut the ties so you can unleash your inner entrepreneur. Your host, Thomas Helfrick, is on a mission to make more entrepreneurs in the world and make them better at entrepreneurship. Welcome back to Never Been Promoted. Uh, you know, we're on a mission to help a million entrepreneurs get better at entrepreneurship and, and get better at life. And we're doing this through like micro mentoring. And micro mentoring is just learning from others, maybe not so formally, but just just try to pick up one thing from somebody else who's, you know, on that entrepreneurial path, who's succeeded, who's failed, who's uh, faced adversity um, and maybe has overcome it or not. But if you can learn one thing today, you've done your job to get better at entrepreneurship. Now, if this is your first time here, I do hope it's the first of many. And if you've been here before, as you know, you get dad points. Dad points, you shove them in your pocket. You feel great about yourself for doing a great job and you have no idea where to spend them. Once again, I still think I should build an app for that, but we'll, we'll get around to that when the bandwidth frees up. Uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you haven't already you know, and you like the show and you, and you, it's fun, and, and you think it's five star worthy, go to Apple or Spotify and, and you know, for never been promoted and give us a five star rating. It does so much to help us build the community and it helps the guests get more exposure for what they're doing. And, and jump on the YouTube channel, which has exploded over a million entrepreneurs um, following uh, at youtube.com at never been promoted. So all those things are really important for the growth of the community. And I thank you for it. And we're going to meet our guest now. It's John Carroll. He is the founder of City Leadership. So if there's something going wrong in your city, you can blame him. Not true. Um, John, how are you? Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Now, you live in Memphis, Tennessee. Before we get to your background, have you ever tried to capture a duck at the uh, at the, the hotel there? I, met, I had it in my mind now. I just forgot the name. The Peabody. The, 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 the Peabody Hotel. Hotel. Obviously, you're talking about you know, one of the most classic uh, rituals uh, you know, where the ducks live on the roof and they come and parade down every morning and stay in the fountain in the lobby all day and then parade back up. I've not captured a duck. My, I've I've had a child who's been able to be the honorary duck master Ooh. for the day. So uh, that's pretty fun. And if you're ever in town, be glad to uh, you know, take you up on the roof of the Peabody and you can kind of see their palace. They, these ducks live it, live it good. I would, I want to be a duck, uh, a duck, where you call master for the day. I want people to say, what the duck? That's all I, that's all I want to hear. And I can just go home. Um, <laughs> all right. You ready for this one? Here's your, I, I yeah, make your question. If you were arrested, no explanation, what would your friends and family assume you had done? Oof. So I have been arrested. So <laughs> they the, can't the, use that the, one. That's, yeah, so, so I won't use what they have think of that. But I would say if, if, I, if I called my friends or family from jail, they would have assumed that I was involved in a prank that went wrong. And that I was trying to do something that was probably actually against the law as a prank and somehow got caught. And uh, no one thought it was as funny as I did. Right. Like I may have not even gotten done with the prank. I was trying to do something. Uh, but that's what they would have assumed. Now, that could have ranged all over the place. But that's what that's what I think they would assume if, if I had if got whatever. So. Would, would there have been alcohol or any other uh, fun stuff involved? You know, I don't know if it'd be alcohol. I think it would be, you know, some sort of incredibly elaborate, like I would have, uh, you know, been up on taking over a billboard coming into our city to put some sort of sign that we had put on it. Or, you know, um, we actually tried to do this and it didn't quite work out, but um, we were putting these cutting film covers over spotlights that were shining up to the city to like mark that this event was happening but we were trying to put different logos and stuff on there to make it shine and to the sea. We, I mean, this is a story from this year. Oh, I, th um, I thought you were like, you were had to pretending this happened. I'm like, this is very detailed, but this actually happened. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. Like this actually happened. Like we, we went over and measured it one night and then we made this thing and then we put it on top of it, but there wasn't quite enough cloud coverage where you could kind of see the symbol. And so then we were trying to re-angle the light and then somebody asked us what we were doing and then we ran away. So I mean, like, could have been arrested, but uh, I mean, this is actually a true story from like just a couple of months ago. So, 
So, uh, so this, these these are some these are some things we've we've been involved. So probably a prank yeah. gone wrong. That would be yeah. it. Would be something that uh, meant to be wholesome fun, not meant to be bad, but probably breaking. The I, I would have uh, all of if it would have been me in Memphis. Had been sitting on Elvis's couch in his house while people were going by, and just waving at people. Oh now, yeah, I, 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 we were there. Yes. I was like. I'm afraid to touch the carpet because God knows how much DNA is on that thing. But I mean, I, I kind of wanted to just hop that thing and sit in the couch and see how long it took some of the notice, like sleep on it, like lay down. Be like, oh, that guy is. I know that gets you arrested. Like, get, get, get behind a corner. A place to start playing a game of racquetball Stupid. there. Like, you know, I love racquetball. I played junior. Like, just like get out there and start hamming around. Practice, just drill, like on yes. four hands down the line, one after another. Yeah, your headband, oh, yeah. high socks, short really shorts, short, tight shorts. In. Yeah, saying that you've got a hey, we we've got this reserved at eleven. We've got a match happening, like it's a group a, of you, uh, like hey, come on, it's our turn, like that kind of get doubles going in there. Yes, exactly. That I mean, hey, confidence opens up a lot of doors. Um, so uh, yeah, there's definitely I got plenty of stories of doors that we shouldn't have opened that confidence opened. Um, so not force, just confidence. All right. So if you've listened to this point, you're like, what's the point of this podcast? We're going to get to it. Okay. We're just learning the guest here. We're talking to each other, <laughs> finding each other out, seeing if we're going to move in. All right. Uh, do you want to start with your kind of, you know, tell a story about your background and what you're working on right now? Yeah, man. So yeah, I'm from a town called Murfreesboro, Tennessee. It's outside Nashville. It's, it's a bigger city now. When I was growing up there, it was a tiny little town. And, um, you know, um, I, I grew up there, very blue collar family, grandfather's milkman, you know, dad sold construction parts, that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, lived that kind of life. First person in my family ever go off to college, um, did that kind of world, moved to Texas, learned some things, started getting entrepreneurial, moved to Memphis 20 years ago to start a company, thought I'd live here for a year or two, fell in love with this place. Sold that company, started another company, sold that company along the way, got involved with philanthropy. And I've started a nonprofit that we treat like very much like a startup and a company and business and um, and very entrepreneurial. It's not really a startup anymore, but 14 years ago. And um, I sold my last company I, I sold. I, I came on staff here afterwards in 2017. And so uh, we've been doing that ever since. And uh, we're, we're trying to help the good guys do more good. And we call it ROG, what's our return on generosity instead of uh, ROI. And so we measure that, create data. We help people maximize their generosity. We think when they see it maximized, they actually create more of it. Uh, just like investments, uh, people invest more dollars if they can see the numbers. So that's what we're working on here. Uh, there's a lot of details into that, but um, that's kind of the real big over picture that would that would relate to an entrepreneurial kind of business set mindset in your well, audience. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And, and the idea of uh, generosity, right, is uh, uh, I'm a firm believer in, in part of this podcast and this whole thing we do with Never Been Promoted is to help entrepreneurs get better. I really do. I have a really high passion for it and a calling to help them because it's so hard. And, and what I have found, just discovered really, is by helping others, by having conversations with you to help promote what you're doing or and you, you sharing, I'm learning as well. And so my learning of becoming a better entrepreneur is increasing by helping others, by being generous with kind of like time and resources that I have to produce the show and do these things. I get to ask great questions, interact with people, build a great network. Um, and, it, and, and at the same time, help you and, and, you know, and if there's conversations that happen to others. So the generosity piece, yeah. it's almost like a workout. It's like it's, it's something you feel like you're going to get to. Right. Like, you know, like, oh, I'm going to go work out eventually. This guy, I need, I need to calm down a little bit. And you never do because you never build it into your day because you don't see it as important. Right. Uh, but I think generosity works that same way. If, if you can find something every day to go help somebody with, go do something, not money. Money's great. And that's a great way to be generous. But I think your time matters probably even more in your expertise um, or a mix of both. Um, but anyway, I, I think that's great. Do you, do you want to give a layer like who you're kind of, who you initially kind of really target to help? Like, who's, who's the one that's hurting? that needs to do this or needs to receive this? Yeah. 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 Great question. So, so we're located still in Memphis and, um, and we focus uh, almost exclusively on organizations here, not because we don't want to help other cities and that kind of stuff, but because it's expensive 
for us to make an impact when you start traveling yeah. and thinking through all the other factors that Im- imply in that. And so we share a lot of our concepts and things to other organizations, other philanthropists in those, in those sorts of ways. But we try to focus our services because it keeps our cost uh, down in actually being able to provide the impact. And uh, initially, um, when I was when I owned a business and was just being asked, just like other people do, you know, people reach out to you, whether they're from your church or from your community or whatever it is, and they want to meet with you and they're looking for a donation, right? You know, whether it's your homeless shelter or the school or uh, after school program or whatever that is, they're looking, hey, could you make a donation? Would you sponsor this gala? Would, you know, uh, would, would you do that kind of stuff? And they're usually looking for that kind of money. And so out, how actually how we started was, was an org just had asked me to make a $5,000 donation. And I was like, well, what are you trying to do? And so what they were trying to do was they were trying to raise $30,000 to rebrand the homeless shelter, logo, websites, all sorts of different kinds of stuff in that uh, up up and down the thing. And I thought, man, instead of me just giving you five grand to do all that stuff, I was like, I have a crew and team of my staff. Like, what if we donated a week of our time and we just did all this for you for free? And what I found though was, was that from a business perspective, your audience will get this, is that by me donating that week, I was still paying people regularly and, and, and it's just kind of whatever. But I couldn't take my a tax benefit from that because of the way it's structured. I was just paying employees directly. Even money that I would put in my donor advised fund, I don't know how many of your listeners have a DAF, I can't take money out of that tax deducted money and, and hire a for-profit person. I have to send that money to another nonprofit. So um, so what I found was I really enjoyed actually volunteering in that way, right? Like like bringing business skills to a, a, to a nonprofit uh, and solving that problem. But I needed a tax engine that worked better for that. So my accountant recommended creating a nonprofit. So then that way I could donate money to the nonprofit and then use the money from the nonprofit to hire people to help people. So that's how it started. Uh, And it was really just kind of like, let's help the good guys do more good. Over time, what we've decided to focus on is we try to identify hundreds of kids a year who are in either pre-K, kindergarten, or up to kind of sixth grade who will join one of our six schools that we have here in Memphis. Uh, And so across those schools from pre-K to 12th grade, we have about 5,000 students who are getting educated through that process. And we try to radically change their predictive future. So in America, um, the average person who's born into poverty, only 16 out of 100 people born into poverty are out of poverty by the age of 30. In Memphis, that number is six. In the zip codes we work in, it's closer to one to two. And so we try to create a long-term plan, not only to help you get them educated and accepted to college, but we have a 10-year post-high school scenario where they're engaged in that. And so we have a 28-year process that we're measuring it every single year of trying to move as many people as possible out of poverty in the long term, but not just for their own sake, but to get them back involved and in, in engaged in the city to create a, create a poverty tipping point at scale. Very interesting process. We're you know about 14 years into and so um, we're, we're, we're all over the place trying to figure that out. But it, it costs tens of millions of dollars to do it at the scale. Yeah, and yeah, I, I get I don't criticized is the right word, but I'm, I'm a firm believer. If, if you don't succeed, it is your fault. And I mean, is if you can't do anything possible at your means to find the success you want, you're holding on to an excuse, even if it's poverty, because the truth is you could work your way out of it a little bit. You could do some things. And I know there's tons of shit stacks against people in the U.S. or other places. How I know that's a hard take, but I, I'm kind of one that says, but if you really want to make something happen, you will. And if that meant you had to do something illegal for a while, I mean, like if you like, if you had to go sling, you know, steal some shit, and do, but you got some money with the idea that I'm not trying to steal. I'm just trying to get money to get out, to get a job, to get a place, to get a shower. Fine. Yeah. I don't care. Just don't hurt anyone. But my point is, if you really want something now, that being said, I know that's extreme. That's an extreme place to cause like a conversation. But how much is it in, in a valid excuse as it is? versus because I, I don't understand the situation. I'm saying when I make that statement, yeah. how does that make you feel? And how do you think that is to reality of, 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 is it just a huge excuse you can't overcome or is it, is it just unwarranted? 
Yeah, so I think just like, uh, you know, uh, people in poverty, um, whether or not you're born into poverty or you're born into significant wealth, um, people kind of fall in general into the same kind of demographics of what we would say is, is it's still kind of the 80, 20 rule, you know, like 20% of the people are 80% of the stuff and, you know, uh, kind of deal, whatever it is. And so we kind of view it as whether you're born in poverty or born into wealth, you know, um, 10% of the people are going to succeed, whether you help them or not, like they're just going to unbelievably succeed kind of whatever. And 10% of the people are going to fail, whether you help them or not. Like you can work all you want to, but they're going to fail. And so like our job a lot of times is trying to identify who those people are and stay away from them. Like we, cause we don't have mix or bandwidth. We don't, I don't want to spend any time trying to help the 10% that are already going to succeed. Like they're going to succeed without us. Kind of like what you're saying, like they're going to make that hustle kind of thing happen all on their own. Um, and so we don't, we don't want to spend time with them. We don't even want to take the credit for that. Um, but, and the people who are going to fail, we don't want to spend time with them. We don't want to waste our time in that this space. So we're trying to identify who are the people who are just need a little bit of help to get over that edge. What's that next kind of 20 to 40% of that population? And what are the things that we can scale and help with that are the most efficient that would help them succeed faster uh, or help them overcome some of the fragility that they face that maybe you and I didn't face in this sort of thing? Um, because now they have the education and the framework, but even having the education accepted to college, it, it doesn't matter if you're accepted. If no one in your family has ever had a car in their entire life and no one's ever has had a driver's license and you're sitting here going, like, I have a full ride to go to college. I just can't get there. I literally don't have enough money. I don't have whatever. Like we don't have enough money to buy bed sheets. I don't have enough money to wash my clothes when I get there. There's no one to send me money. Like, like those are little kind of things that actually don't take that hard to, to solve um, and kind of figure out. But what ends up happening is, is because you can't solve that, you end up going down a path of having this super high potential, but you end up doing things that are maybe like you just end up working at, uh, at Wendy's and you maybe become a really good Wendy's manager, which might be okay, but you could have been in engineering school. You could have been in accountant. You could have been, you know, pre-med, but you just didn't have a way to overcome that kind of stuff, which creates a whole other level of generational wealth instead of just working class processes. So that's the way we kind of see it and like in, in figuring out ways to identify those kind of little steps along the way. It's hard. 18 to 24 year olds more than ever in history, it doesn't matter if you're poor or rich or whatever, don't know what they want to do and are more confused by Instagram and TikTok on what real life should look like and how that looks. And so that becomes one of our biggest barriers of making success is, is that they're, you know, looking at their phones seven hours a day and, you know, think that what they're seeing is actual reality yeah. instead of what it really takes to succeed out there in the real world. Well, And, and, and I think uh, when I see that and hear and see that too, first of all, I think 18, 24 year olds do know more and they know a lot less because there's a lot more information, but they don't tell to do with it. Yeah. Um, it's a great way. And, to and, and yeah. you know, I, if I knew as much as I knew in the, at 24 as I do now, oh. He's so smart, right? Um, I get dumber as I get older. Like, man, I really don't know shit. Um, and so, but the but but right there, we describe seven hours. You know, and I, my like my kids are younger, you know, fourteen and under, and they're looking at. I go, well, you could be the consumer, which is you staring at that phone. You can go put it down, and create something, and 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 that the person you're watching is creating something with that phone, and you're consuming with it, and that's why they're on there, and you're watching them, and you're not. So you got to stop. You got to right. quit consuming and go be original and be creative. And they don't like to hear that. But it is what it is. Um, but yeah. then my kid will put out a video and get like, you know, 50,000 views. And we like, you know, have to advertise to get half that. I'm like, but he's yeah. doing Fortnite and I'm doing business and entrepreneurship. Like, which are you going to watch for free? Right. Anyway, um, <laughs> can you can we pivot just a bit? Uh, I want to understand how entrepreneurship yeah. means you because you've gotten multiple successes. You're, you're doing an entrepreneurial thing for philanthropy at a younger age already. You're not like, you know. And this is not your swan song. You're just doing good and you've, you've found success. But how do you, would you define entrepreneurship? Like, what does it mean to you really personally? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, entrepreneurship to me is where someone actually creates something that didn't exist. Um, and I think that that can be inside of the business context, um, you know, for whatever bigger goal that's around that. 
Um, but a lot of times I just, I relate it specifically to the professional context of creating something that didn't exist for the purpose ultimately of what I would say is for others. A lot of times is what the purpose is, is to make money, you know, um, uh, so many entrepreneurs, I'm sure you meet all the time, you know, they, um, usually when they come in my office and they sit over here and they ask for advice or they're trying to start something or whatever, you know, and, and some of this might be slanted because I'm in the, you know, phil- philanthropic world so much. But even I remember when we started our company, sitting around with my buddies and starting kind of things, we, were, we would say, it's like, oh, we're going to create this and we're going to do so much good with our first million. We're going to give this much away and we're going to do whatever. And man, like, you know, it's like you hit go and it was just a crazy storm of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, giving away is like what it became about entrepreneurship came so much as like just creating and surviving. It didn't become about money. It didn't become about philanthropy. It just became about problem solving and overcoming. And I think that, you know, um, when you're not in entrepreneurship, you are a part of a machine that exists and you have a function. When you're a part of entrepreneurship, you are a part of building a machine and continuously recreating yep. it. And I think whether that the, the machine produces money or produces good or produces some other kind of impact, the machine can produce much of everything, but the entrepreneurship is building the machine and continuously revisioning the machine yep. for greater outcomes. And, and if I expand that just a bit, I think and this is, a, uh, if, if, you know, if, if, if I'm expanding away, you're like, no, 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 that's not right. Please do. I expect you to jump in. You're an entrepreneur. You'll jump in. But here, yeah. so I like this idea that you must believe in yourself, right? And uh, others will believe in you. But if you don't believe in yourself, unlikely anybody else is either. So you got to believe in yourself first and foremost. But if you're not able to do that and you're working someplace else, you're also not realizing, in my opinion, what your, you know, your, your higher purpose, God-given purpose is there to do. And so that could be to entertain. It could be like, I help other people. It could be like, I'm here to do X, Y, or build houses. It doesn't matter. But if you're not doing that, then you're part of some other system, somebody else's idea. And that's not there to serve you best. It's there to serve the organization or the institution that created that system itself. It serves them. So if you want to serve yourself better so you can serve others, entrepreneurship to me is the path. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with that. I I think that I think that there's there's nothing wrong with that um, with that with that statement whatsoever. I think that as we process those, like I think that entrepreneurs a lot of times think that they are creating a company. You know, you've heard all the jokes and and you know, like whether it you know when they're making angel pitches or you know getting investments, like every single entrepreneurial pitch ends with to make the world a better place. You know, what I'm saying like like whatever it is, you know, whether it's you know. Uh, making you know, an electric car or trying to come up with a new frozen dinner or creating, you know, whatever a taxidermy business. It's like to make, it's like to make the world a better place. And I think it's that there for some reason, especially before you ever make money um, and, and the younger you are, there's something wrong with making money. Uh, it's like, you, you can't like, you can't say like oh, to make as much money as possible. All right. It's like, like, like nobody wants, wants to hear that when the investor on the other side is analyzing those entrepreneurial pitches going, will this make me money? You know, like like that's, that's what they're 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 making money quickly. So I can. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, they're like, I have a hundred options of where to put this, whatever amount of money, like, you know, it's a, this, you know, this thought. And so when entrepreneurs get really serious about ROI return on investment and understanding, like, like those are people who, can really do, you know, and, and so that's what we would say. The same thing is in the nonprofit world, there's so many nonprofits, people have hundreds of choices of where they want to be charitable with their money. But the same thing that paralyzes entrepreneurial investors, you know, into going, is this really going to create a return on investment? Like, that's a great idea. You seem like an awesome person, but is your business model going to give me a, a, what X return on my finances? We believe that what really paralyzes generosity, just like investment is paralyzation, is that nonprofits aren't communicating what is their return on generosity. If I give you a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars or make a million dollar gift into your nonprofit, what is actually going to happen with that? And why is that a better investment here than the homeless shelter down the street 
or the other school in wherever, or building water wells in Africa or whatever that is. Um, and I think in the same way now that we see VCs looking at, oh, well, I can invest that here or and look at this, this startup in Ghana or look at this opportunity in India. I think from the nonprofit standpoint, we wrestle with that same stuff as well. Uh, it's like realizing that in, in Memphis or in Atlanta or whatever city you're in, you're not just competing against you know, generosity here. It's like those investors are opening up their Facebook or their wives are or their husbands are or, or their teammates are at work. And they're being hit with opportunities to give generously yeah. to feeding programs in India or water wells in Africa or whatever, orphanages in Colombia. And so they can send their money overseas, you know, and you're, you're dealing with that sort of ROG yeah, as well. I think it's, it's fantastic. And I love that you're, you're, this is a very beautiful initiative you have for sure. Uh, maybe give me a success story. So like what, give me like the, what's the, you know, in, in your pitch, what's the one story you, you, uh, talk about man uh we have several different platforms in 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 a couple of different areas and so you know when you asked that uh, i immediately had three different thoughts so i'm just i'm literally just going to pick one but i think one is is uh what we call teach 901 so um the, the the concept is is to create one collaborative catalytic recruiting retention process for teachers, for the entire city. And the reason why we do that is, is that there's a massive teacher shortage everywhere, right? So like we, we say all the time is that if it's a game of musical chairs, there's 10 chairs, there's only seven teachers walking around. Music stops, they sit wherever they want. A seventh grade science teacher can go to any municipality in the country and get a job today. Not like next fall when school starts, today. Right. Like they could walk out of their classroom. I mean, and go get hired whenever you pay someone thirty four thousand dollars a year to do a job that probably should be paid more. Sure. <laughs> right. It's ridiculous. All over yeah. The and, and, but, all right. Keep going. Go yeah. Right and, and so the pay and different kind of things. But like there's a lot of the other reasons why people want to stay in that work. But we have a bunch of different schools. And what I saw when we kind of did this is that we saw other cities where there were schools fighting each other for teachers. Not only were they, you know, kind of secretly stealing teachers around that different kind of space, but they were spending collectively millions of dollars in advertisements, competitive advertisements, hiring marketing professionals, spending literally like you know, dozens of school systems, spending tens of if not hundreds of thousands of dollars competing against each other for the same people. So we just created a spot where like, Hey, we create this trust. We're like, what have we got everybody to just advertise together? Just agree to is like, we don't have to buy billboards. We don't have to spend advertising. Everybody posts their jobs together. We do all our job fairs together. There's no expenses here. If everybody's involved, there's no, like where it is really inexpensive to be able to operate that kind of system. And now we're in year 11 of doing that, right? Where, you know, all these jobs are posted in one spot. People share the same database, see that kind of stuff. And what our big thought was, is what if we turn this from being operator bill, where all the operators are in charge of everything to, we call it teacher town. Teachers are the commodity and we even help, we even promote and we train schools to say like, instead of a teacher being a bad fit here and you fire, like go like, what about their personality? Understand the other types of schools so that they can be, they might be the right fit in another place because then leaving the profession is terrible. It creates two open spots instead of just leaving one, which is hard to, you know, now you're competing with the one other because okay, you rush them out of the, the space. And so um, we have all sorts of survey data that we've done with Vanderbilt University and all these different kind of things where we figured out what makes people re recruit and retain to different places. Mm -hmm. And that has been a really amazing kind of thought process uh, that we're actually looking at contracting and consulting with other school districts now all over the country uh, around that. And that's the services that people could yeah. approach us about as we try to expand the success that we've had here in Memphis around it. I, I, I love, love that. It's like a bigger picture. It helps like, to, you know, that has such a downstream effect of helping kids get better educated, get it, you know, getting better candidates in place, which I mean, everything gets raised up by uh, that. And, and one who says, <laughs> I'm a fan of education specifically in kids. I think they could probably do it wrong. And I'm sorry, do it differently. And there's, it's, it's not wrong to go to college. <laughs> um, but this, you better yeah. get out of college debt free or you're going to talk about getting yourself shoved into the cog of a wheel of, of not being able to do entrepreneurship. Get out. Don't worry about the name brand. Get out. Get it. 
Right. Because honestly, it's that's what matters more. I'll get off that pedestal. I could do a whole podcast on that. <laughs> like a whole yeah. new podcast, not just an episode. Uh, yeah. In your own personal journey, have you, you know, what is the kind of the biggest challenge you faced? D- did you overcome it? And if so, how? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, you know, I've had a couple and, um, and I would say is that there's a couple of pieces of that. So one is, you know, um, that, that all are ingredients to add up to the biggest one. So, so one is, is that coming from a family that, um, you know, wasn't, you know, college bound or affluent or those kinds of things. And so, and I, I think that, again, not that it's uncommon that people ha- had to come over that, but, but I think that coupled with, uh, I grew up, I, I just grow up, I am currently, I'm dyslexic. And so like school was you know, exceptionally hard for me. And the eighties was not a great place to be dyslexic for people to really, understand. it's like, yeah. like I got told I was dumb in school. Like literally, I mean, I have memories like scarring, you know, moments in history where like teachers are like, what do you, why are you, you're either acting dumb or you are dumb. Like You just, speak like, so well, you're so smart. Why are you pretending not to want to, you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. And I'm like, I, I don't like, and you don't understand. Like, I don't, I read it as that. That's what I thought it said. Or I don't know why I can't write those words the right way. Like I, I thought that that's what I wrote. You know what I'm saying? And so like, uh, or, you know, I know I get asked all the time, like, what do you read? And I'm like, I, I don't read either. Yeah. Well, you, I've never read a book. You saw the Beastie Boys and album, so like, 3 ATM 3. You're like, that clearly says eat me uh, on the. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so like, and, and, and I think there's some other superpowers that come with that, you know, um, that, that inability. But I think, you know, a couple of those things and then, um, you know, uh, kind of the trajectory of that kind of just led me my whole life to think like I was an imposter. Um, I, you know, I, I wasn't actually smart. I wasn't intelligent. I wasn't. Whatever. So I just didn't believe in myself. So I think the biggest thing I ever come with was believing in myself. Like and, and I just in, in, back to what you said, nobody's going to do if you don't believe in yourself like. Like I, I was inside, felt like I was being a fraud on the outside, acting like I'm great. You'd be great to do whatever. And on the inside, I'm like, I'm an idiot. I don't know what I'm doing. I've never succeeded. I have no backup plan. I'm everything I'm talking about is going to be BS. And so like, cause I've never actually done anything. And I think that along the way I began to actually believe in myself and then understand who I was and that understand that I was just uniquely different. I, I think for a long time in my head, I thought everybody else thought one way and I was, you know, I, I was the one that was dumb and different and didn't know how they were thinking. And what I learned over time, right, is that everyone had their own internal insecurities. Everyone had their own perspective. No one actually thought the same way, you know what I'm saying? And so like, and, uh, and I was uh, actually a part of this very diverse group of skills and abilities and I had this kind of stuff. And so like, and it wasn't that I ultimately believed I was better than anybody else. It's just that I started to believe in that I was, uh, that I had my own unique gifts that I could bring to the table and that everybody did as well. And so um, uh, it, was, it wasn't that I was lower than everyone. And I now think I'm better than everyone. It was just that I, my, my big overcome moment was realizing that everyone is uniquely powerful and uniquely right. gifted and everyone looking for a place to be able to express that in their own way. Yeah, it, I heard it right. I think you said you're better than everyone. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you love about your current, you know, endeavor? And what do you really, what could you do without? Oh, man. Well, uh, I could do without the rising cost of trying to help people. I think sometimes I'm, uh, um, you know, uh, Every year we go to help people. If we want to help the same amount of people last year that we helped this year, it, it, it costs more, right? I mean, just inflation costs more. And, you know, when I'm in the for-profit world, uh, man, if things cost more, if I'm selling an item for $20, well, I just, yeah, I, I now sell it for 25 And And honestly, over and over again in the business world, every time costs went up, usually my profits went up because, I, you know, if cost went up a dollar, I'd raise it too. You know, and so it was like, okay, great. <laughs> like, and there was something about that, you know, raising the cost of things, you know, you know, made made me more money. Yeah, um, I think in the in the nonprofit world, and the costs go up, and you go back to people, and you're like, hey, that hundred thousand dollar gift you gave last year to do that same thing this year is one hundred eighteen thousand, and they're like, I just gave you a hundred thousand. You know, what I'm saying? I, I I know, but like, 
it costs more to do that exact same thing. And because we did it so well, there's a lot more people who need this and we think we could scale it. So if you gave 200,000, we think we could triple the amount of people who are doing it, right? Like, wait a second. You know, so your, your, your cost per person is going down, um, but the amount of money needed is going up and the people there are going, well, I was just going to give you 50 grand this year. I was like, well, if you give us 50 grand, we have to stop that whole thing. That whole thing I could do without because <laughs> it is trying to talk people into that, like the rising cost of generosity um, is really, really hard. Even though I could give them a better ROG, right? Like, um, you know, uh, for for 200,000, I could triple your ROG, uh, your return on generosity. Um, but they have a hard time dealing with the rising cost. So then you have to invite other people to the process. And uh, that that's really, really complex. Now, what do I love about my job? Like, I love that we are not serving a direct problem. Like so many nonprofits serve someone's need for the day or week or month. We are strategically looking at tipping point change of solving, you know, problems. And I think that from an organizational perspective, that part gets me out of bed every day. Like, like, and, and not that the people who serve people directly is not great. Right. But I, I would look at that as, that's not the entrepreneurial side of this thing. Like that's hiring and getting a job and being an accountant, right? When you are being a social worker, incredibly awesome job or being a teacher, incredibly awesome job, but you're, you're working in the factory of solving, you know, serving the problem, you know, uh, or serving, you know, their community. We're trying to solve out there. Not that it would be like a race that we don't need teachers, right. Or a race that we don't need or whatever. Um, but that part really inspires me. And I think it makes it worth it for me to sit across from somebody and say, yeah, but this will be the best $200,000 you invest in making a difference that you maybe you possibly could invest. Yeah. We'll keep you up at night. Man, not spending enough time with my kids before they grow up. Um, and, and I'm a good dad. I don't mean that to be, you know, uh, I think my kids would say that if my kids were on this interview, I think they would say I'm a good dad. Um, but I, you know, it, it just feels like trying to hold sand, you know, it's like everywhere I'm going, I'm just holding sand. I keep losing it. It's like, it's hard to yeah. keep it in your fingers and they keep growing up. You know, my oldest son is in college now. He's, you know, my best friend. We talk every day. It's incredible. Um, I, if I could hit the reset button and do it all over again, I would race him again. It's just incredible. But I do that with all my kids, but you know, I've got girls that are juniors and eighth grader and, and I've got a little first grader. So I've got a while before my house is empty, but, um, but um, but I just think like just every minute I can get with them. And, and so like at night, you know, um, I go to bed thinking, uh, man, I just I, I could go, I could go for another game night or another snuggle session or another phone call or another hangout. Um, they're just never a burden. Um, they're my joy. And I, I just miss it already. Yeah. Uh, so trying to be present in the day um, that I have and not be so futuristic. Yeah that I'm already imagining them being gone, that I allow myself to be sad today. Like they're with me right now. Right. So I shouldn't be upset about that, but I imagine a future where they're not here anymore and I miss that. And so I'm just making sure I make the most of yeah. it. It's mindfulness, right? It's not they don't be the past mm-hmm. or the future. Just be right now. That's a, it's hard to do, especially when you're uh, your mind, when you have a wandering mind, when you have this kind of burn to do more in life, uh, Sometimes you miss the life right in front of you. I, I address that in my book a bit where I'm like, you know, I'm talking to kids and I'm like just craving in my mind for them to stop talking. So I can look at my phone, look at the email that I just, put. <laughs> like, you're like, why am I like that? And, you know, and I, I get it. That's a, and that's, that, that does keep you up. It's like, Hey, like, you know, I want to enjoy the, the moments better. Cause like, you know, I got one's going to college in four years. I'm like, man, four years. She's gone. Like, that's it. That's the time. So I, I feel you. Yeah, brings a little tears to me right now. So we're going to just go off camera. Man they, man, they get that car. They get that car, man. Between between social media and the car and the friends and playing a sport, you know, four years is maybe 40 more good nights right. a year of just uh, well, of some good we, uh, It's not the uh, 300 plus nights a year that you had when they were 400. Yeah, that's right. You know? It's uh, well, We keep social media down in our family, but I will tell you, we, we invested in a, in a pool with the idea that we want them to bring their friends over. It's the great equalizer. We got that, and then we also yeah. made the investment. We live in a lake community, but not on a lake. And we had got this rare opportunity just to buy a 
shitty boat. And it's not even that bad. It's just like, you know, there's not many on there. It's like, it's like an electric small little lake. But the point is a friend of mine told me once, Hey, you want to keep the family together, have a boat, get a pool and make it where everyone comes to your house to hang out. And, and, and that way they're always around. And they also keep a little bit of control what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Thomas, I don't know if you and I had the same mentor, but I had a guy tell me a long time ago, man, camping and pools is the great equalizer for age groups and different kind of stuff. And then make your house the one that everybody wants to come to. And so like, I mean, any kid can ask any time to have any friend come over any day. And I always say yes. I always make sure yeah. we do whatever. Monday night, become friends and family night. Our kids bring all their friends over. We agree upon what to cook. I give them my credit card. They go to the grocery store. They buy all this stuff. They cook it all. They make serve a big meal. They can, they can have five friends over. Yeah. They can have 55 friends. Like, I don't care what yeah. it is, but it's just like, I just want to be there and be a part of it. And um, man, it, it's yeah. instead of arguing with whether or not you have family dinner or they're going to go out to eat with their friends, it's like we'll just make it, 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 it with your friends. Our idea is like, hey, ask the parents if I'm going to come. We can hang out and get to know them, unless we don't like the parents, and then we'll be like, could you stay home? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah exactly. No, no. Just to get yeah. We'll do that, man. Well, like I'm like any parents that come, I'll make cocktails. Kids are in there making chicken parmesan or whatever, yeah. and I'm like, great. Let's yeah. do it. Well, that yeah. will be our rule when we get it. It'll be a. Uh, you know, cannonballs are cool. Diving is not allowed. We're, we're going to go a little shallower, but also it's going to be more like, if you show up, bring food and your favorite drinks. I'm not feeding the whole neighborhood here. You you, you can bring your stuff and clean up or I'm, you're not, you get a, you get an adult timeout. All right. All right. Let's, let's, yeah. let's, uh, just conscious of time in the podcast. I, um, fast forward a year. Yeah. What did you accomplish? What are you proud of? I mean, I am really, I am really proud of my kids. Uh, not to keep harping on the kids thing, but I know that's not what you're asking. But I think that there's a lot of entrepreneurship that goes involved in parenting, and and so I don't want to miss that side of it. And so I think that bringing those entrepreneurial skills that so many of your listeners have, I think entrepreneurs so oftentimes have regrets of having not spent enough time with their kids because they invested a hundred hours a week in getting their company started, and they missed some big swath of season. You, you hear that and, you know, and read it in autobiographies and and hear it in, you know, people talking all the time. But I think it's like, man, you've got these incredible skills of creating these kind of spaces. And so like doing that with your kids, I think is, is a big piece of it. I would say is that that same sort of thing kind of translate over to the company is that um, I have in large part, I think you could ask any of uh, any of the employees that we've had in any of our different companies and teammates is that. I've, in, I've invested into, they've been better at being themselves in a professional context with the season that they've had with us at whatever stage that is. And so, you know, we've got 20 FTEs right now and, you know, uh, we've had 60 plus over the history of just this nonprofit, but we've had, you know, hundreds that have been employed in previous companies. And, and I would, and I'd be willing to say, if you pulled them that they would say is that their time here, they grew in their capacity uh, grew in their space that we were just as concerned about how they were improving as we were about us reaching their mission. And so even much so much so that we don't have performance reviews, we call it alliances. So we have an alliance, our, our company, which I represent, has an alliance with each one of our individuals. And so we think about what is the, what is both of those things kind of pursuit of getting better and how do we make sure that we are aligned to both betterment and I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud of uh, the culture that we've created around that. And I think a lot of people have succeeded in that uh, space for that. It's awesome. That'd be, it's, that's beautiful. And um, two questions left. And I think the, the last one's going to be how to get a hold of you. So don't, don't waste your question and answer on this one. Uh, there's okay. one question I should have asked you, but didn't. What was it? Okay. Uh, man, I think, um, you know, When should people be serious about generosity? Um, and I think that that is, is something that, um, you know, uh, that people really think is that I think people start entrepreneurial. They start with this real mindset of how quickly they're going to be generous and how they're going to be so generous to their employees and so generous to their customers and so generous to the world. And then I think that, you know, keeping an organization and creating or making it survive and keeping it going is so consuming that it just beats the mess out of them through the end of it. And then, like you said, you, you referenced earlier, 
is it kind of swan song or later in life or whatever they they start to uh, imply, you know, or how they're going to be generous with some sort of kind of thing. And they're thinking through it. And it's usually when they already have everything that they wanted financially. And so um, and so they're not really uh, they're, they're kind of like feeling almost guilty about spending all this money on themselves and they, they got to kind of give back and that kind of stuff. And so um, and, and I would just say just in general is generosity is something that you should be budgeting with your money and time and your heart and your stewardship in all aspects of your life at whatever stage you are and doing that right now. And I think that like you referenced, it's, it's almost kind of like eating well or working out or dieting or even just saving for retirement, like different personalities approach those things and care about those things at, at different times in different kind of ways. And so some of us are naturally inclined that way. And so they, they can do that better. I think others need a coach or need a vision or need a template. And they need accountability uh, in that sort of space. And so um, and I think don't wait until you have a million dollars to give away. Like start being generous with a, a greater percentage of your time and money and income and in um, uh, and your business uh, along the way. And they realize that you're modeling that not just for, you know, your peers around you, the other CEOs and founders and that kind of stuff. You're modeling it for your employees, your founder group. You're modeling for your spouse and partner. You're modeling for your children. Like, what does generosity really mean to you? And I think that uh, that's something that people should be really intentional about. We could get into all sorts of details and whys and whatever. We'll save your audience the time of that um, and let them discover on their own. But I think just um, I think now is the time. Right. No matter what age you're hearing this at 24, 44, 84. Now's the time to, to think, how can I be more generous and how, how does that fa- affect every aspect? of my yeah, life? I don't think people should guess. I think they should get a hold of you. So who should get a hold of you and how do they do that? Man, I, I would just, you know, one is I, I'm pretty open book. And so like um, man, my cell phone number is out there. I mean, it's on our website. Like, um, you know, you can text me or whatever. I, I have a, a lot of um, I, I'm really easy to get a hold of. My organization is called City Leadership. So cityleadership.org. You can find me. You can find my email. You can find our whole staff. You can find whatever. And so if, if you want to find that, you can find us on social. Uh, almost everything. I'm John Carroll, 77. That's the year I was born. I'm 46. And so, uh, but um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, whatever those kind of things are. So it's, I'm not hard to get a hold of in that. But you're talking about who should get a hold of me. Um, man, if you heard something in here that you have a question about, just know you're not bothering me to ask. Uh, but, you know, if you're an organization that is looking for ways to improve your ROG, or if you're an individual that's like, hey, I, I want to be generous, like uh, we're well, we're more than happy to tell people how they could do that in their own context. But if you would like to trust us with that, um, you know, we're investing about $60 million a year throughout the portfolio, um, you know, uh, in, into Memphis. Uh, and it's in, impacting about 12,000 students a year. We've got you know, tens of thousands of other historical engagements. We'd love to show you how you could make a real difference. And people might be like, well, I should do that in my own city. I'm like, well, do you send any money outside of your city for anything, whether that's you know another country or nationally or whatever? Like, like you can make a real impact in real people's lives right here. We'd love to show you how to do that's that. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it, it, listen, we'll have in the show notes. Do you want to, do you want to give a email or something that makes it easy if someone's too lazy to go look? Yeah. John J O H N at cityleadership.org. That's right to me. It goes directly to my phone right here. So, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you can, you can get a hold of me right awesome. there. Awesome. Hey, th- uh, John, thanks so much for coming on today. It's been great. Hey man, thanks for having me. You were really great. And, made it and I smell nice too. I showered this week. All right. Anybody who made it this far in the uh, show. You rock. And this was your first time. Once again, thank you so much for trying it out and making it this far. And I hope you come back. If you've been here before, thank you for coming back. You know, get out there, go help an entrepreneur, go unleash your entrepreneur. Uh, you know, give us the follow on, on YouTube if you can at, at Never Been Promoted and, and Apple or Spotify or wherever you like to listen to your podcast. Just take a moment, give it a nice five star. And if you didn't like it or you think it's less than five, give me an email um, or get in contact with me and tell me how we can improve it. But, you know, you're your contributions and support the show, support the entrepreneurs that come on here and all the things they do. So thank you so much for listening. Once again, Thomas Helfrich, your host, 
you've never been promoted. Get out there, go unleash your entrepreneur. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Never Been Promoted podcast. If you liked today's show, subscribe at youtube.com forward slash at never been promoted. Until next time, get out there and go unleash your inner entrepreneur. Thanks again to InstantlyRelevant.com for producing the show, all the social media, all the content, posts, articles, everything. Could not do it without you. InstantlyRelevant.com. Check it out. They're awesome. Once again, InstantlyRelevant.com.